Ah, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time. I am Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer, Matt Doyle, David Goss. Impossible is an opinion. There's one virtue for us in life. It is courage. Without courage, you can't do anything. Certainly, you can't win MLS Cup. Merry Christmas. It's going to be a happy crew year in Columbus parade on Tuesday. The original black and gold won their third MLS cup this weekend. And this is one of my favorite shows of the year. We get to celebrate. It's a culmination. It's everything we've been building up to since we should get a trophy. I don't know. January 1st slash the last two years, five years, 10 years, however long this show has been on the air. We need a, uh, a Philly pow. Mo- like mock that we can lift in here we should always have one. Mm. Oh yeah the philly pow yeah we, we get that we had the little one we used to have the little we need a little one. one i need one that i can need a replica yeah what about the one that they used to blow up on the field those you are know, good like ones jam it in behind us yeah, those yeah. are good ones yeah <laughs> oh it's monday december 11th of course the columbus crew are campeones for the third time in history the crew take the cup the mls ogs the original in rare company now with the galaxy with dc united Three cups, all different crests. That's the answer to a random trivia question that. that may or may not come up in your life at some point. It will if we host another MLS trivia. Now I can guarantee it. It's just so this is like your your extra credit question right. where it's like the teacher. Well, like, no, oh, I'll put it on here. Yeah, yeah. Well, no. You're like, oh, did you read the book? Did you listen yeah, to the podcast? Exactly. Well, exactly. no. Well, no. Will Fernandez becomes the first black coach to coach an MLS Cup and to win MLS Cup. Darlington Nagby becomes the tenth player to win four MLS Cups. On four, Jaime Moreno, Dwayne DiRosario, Craig Weibel, Eddie Robinson, Josh Saunders on five, Jeff Agus, Brian Mullen, and Todd Donovan on six, Landon Donovan, and maybe Darlington could even collect two more. If Wilfred stays around, or Johan Demay takes over, or the crew just keep on rising. Yeah. LAFC, meanwhile, lose a record third final in a single season <laughs> as Denny Bawanga ties the all comps goal record on 38, but it is not enough. Five competitions. 53 games, 62,784 miles of travel, three cup finals, zero major trophies. Wah, wah. Congratulations to the Revs, who have now qualified for the 2024 CONCACAF Champions Cup on the back of LAFC's Yikes. collective failure. Yeah. Uh, just the way they scripted it, yeah. obviously, yeah. Yeah. ahead of the season for the Revs. Weavey, uh, you started off that wonderful soliloquy um talking about courage being the main virtue in life and we all saw you dressed in black you look sharp uh doing the trophy presentation at the end of the game commissioner garber was there obviously uh crew ownership was there darlington nagby was right there as well and you were right next to the trophy ah just in position and you were a coward. I didn't yeah. steal you it. You were a complete oh, I, coward. I didn't even take a touch. I had every opportunity. And Nagby had cramps, so he's not chasing you. I, I even moved the Darlington Sean Zawatsky over. would have to come uh, off the stage to get you. Yeah, there was like a six to eight foot drop off there. My yeah. opportunity was wide open, and I, I didn't even consider. That's that a I lot would. of miles for you to travel to have zero trophies out of uh, How How yeah. much of that decision making mm. was because you were maybe not at your physical best because you had stayed up late the night before uh uh you know preparing for the game Correct. with young tom boger I, I will say this research i lost my voice two times in two days i attribute all of that to being around tom boger in a bar scenario Wait, you went from tom boger volume to ben Bear. volume is very <laughs> loud you tom must boger to ben bear you must project in one week otherwise you're lost when you're around young tom before we get into all the nitty-gritty of the crew's mls cup victory and all the news that came out over the mls cup week whether it was from commissioner doug garber's state of the uh union or all the things that are happening now because don't look don't look anywhere because the trade window is open in MLS. Oh. Free agency starts in two days. The offseason has officially begun, and the Super Draft's on December December 19th. Excuse me. Super Draft is on December 19th, a Tuesday, on MLS Season Pass on Apple TV. Here's a little story for you about my time on the stage. So I told my wife, hey, I'm going to be on the stage doing the trophy presentation. If you guys want to watch, you can do that. And I flew in my mother-in-law to help with the boys, and you know they all gather around the TV to watch. And then... 
I think their assumption was that I would be presenting the trophy. I would be doing something a little bit more than just introducing Commissioner Garber, which huge honor. With your little, very happy to be with your little crew pun as well. Yeah, exactly. And then, so I get a text immediately afterwards from my wife that just says, "The boys are wondering, is that it?" (laughs) And I was like, "Wow." I got home and and Cameron says. Daddy, we, we really thought you were going to do more, but that was so fast. I mean, so did we, Dave. We, we really thought he was going to at least fair. take a touch on that trip. But what you need to tell your family is championships are won by being part of a team. It's true. So you're, no, you're you wrong. were basically um, Olivero's I, I, dummy in the Seattle game. Yeah, well, I was thinking. You let that ball I, through I was, for the great I was Maldi line. Edmondson, you know? Sometimes the no, guy who makes no, the you pass. Were, you were not. You were not. Sometimes the guy who the makes Edmondson. the pass, right? No. I made the no. pass. You, you were right? at best Aiden Morris or Nagby who laid it off to Edmondson four yards to then hit that pass. Look, I can play a square ball. Yeah. That's what we found out. I can play a square ball. Well, I don't need the You can rotate possession if you need it. By the way, thank you. Shout out to, it was wonderful to see and hear from everyone at Laura.com Field and just around Columbus over the course of a few days that I was there. I had people in the stands, one, yes, daring me to steal the cup, two, pulling their phones out and showing me extra time playing on their phone and being like, look, Weeby, check this out, extra time. Guys yelling at me, people yelling at me, kids yelling at me. I took pictures with people. I was either with Jonathan Mensa after the game, and a person came up and said, hey, can I get a picture? And I was like, hey, Jonathan, my bad, man. I tried to step aside to let this fan take a picture with Jonathan Mensa. And the guy's like, no, not Jonathan. He's like, stop. Oh, with wow. you. And that made like, me sick. Yeah. That made me. Stop. You should not have told that story yeah. publicly. That's. <laughs> I felt good about it. But I also felt embarrassed. Okay. Yeah, me too. Stop. All right. Should we get to it? Best thing we saw? Oh, my. I can't get over that. <laughs> that is wild. That's got, that's seeding content right there. That's just giving. That's putting you guys in the best position to succeed for the rest of this show. I mean. If you Boy, can keep, if you can keep the vomit down, that that is, is going to be rough in the group chat for you. I'm just letting you know. That's fine. I'm here to take it. I'm a champion. Yeah, hey, no, obviously, clearly. I will say the best thing I saw in Columbus is just the feeling of being there for history, and history for the players and the coaches and the organization. And I'll get to that, but more so for the fans. Oh wait, the three wise men, the old crest, GBS. Siggy, that group, Marshall, like what a group it was. 2020, 2,500 people saw it. Yeah. It wasn't a true coronation in the way an MLS Cup should be. And that's the pandemic. We all lived through that sort of thing. But to have 2023 come back around with an inspirational team, an inspirational manager, with Tim Bezbachenko taking over and delivering a stadium and a training facility and the trappings that one of the best clubs in the entire league deserves and one of the most dogged, determined, committed fan bases this league has ever seen deserves and having multiple generations experience that people that certainly weren't there in 08, but people who were the small group that was there in 20 and the multitudes that did everything they could to make sure that their team was in the position to be here again, to see them enjoy that and to do it with a team that plays the way they do. That was the best part of me, of, of the whole thing for me. We had a bunch of tweets about this. In hit us up and said it was beautiful to see all the crew fans who've never experienced it before. It's a permanent foundational memory that will run in slow motion for them the rest of their lives. For In, Frankie's header in 08 is that moment. You know, Shawshank SC said the same thing. The joy of being in the Nordeck for this. So many of us didn't get to be there three years ago so we brought it again in 23 and made it up for lost time with interest and then also adds two dynasties in four years that they have destroyed (laughs) that that's running i think off my tweet which i put out there around halftime which was like the crew we'll talk about how dominant the performance was but seattle in 20 was coming off three mls cup appearances in four years they win the ccl the next year they were reigning champions crew dominated and this lafc team's coming off blah 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 and crew dominate again also just to throw in the like things these fans have been through 2015 they hosted they lost at home yeah. so like there's a lot of fans in the building who went through that went through unknown with their club went through not being at a final that they finally win and now they got to be there and Diego Valeri is in the building no yeah. less for this moment and I don't know that there was a bigger admirer of the soccer played by the crew coached by Wilfred Nancy of Darlington Nagby as a 
a player and a human than than Diego. We'll get to more of that later. On the running list of best things I saw, Nordek Tifo, the one, the only, the original black and gold. I thought that was really clever in the moment and played to the history of the club, but also obviously the sort of battle for black and gold between these two teams. Wilfred Nancy's entire staff was in tears from the moment the final whistle blew. I mean, they were breaking down. The hug between Nancy and those guys, it wasn't just like, hey, you think about assistant coaches, all the support staff crying on FaceTime with family members, finding each other for just massive, massive bear hugs. Christian Ramirez's entire family was following around like, you know, like a duck with a bunch of ducklings behind him. He just had like four kids falling around. He's you carrying see the cash. Of cash in the cup. Yes, in the <laughs> so cup. So cute. Cash is sleeping in MLS cup in the Philly Pal. Christian Ramirez's dad comes up to me as the celebrations are ongoing. You know, I just, you know, he's a proud dad. So he's like, I remember all these moments going through. Yeah, I'm, I'm there for Weeby's it. Weeby's crying. At yeah, this I'm night. there for it. All the moments of like when we couldn't, you know, he's like, we, we couldn't afford to put him in some of the teams we wanted to early on. And the way he earned his way up. And now this moment and this week for our family. And, you know, Christian and, the, and his family are gone. They're celebrating. And I'm like, go. Why yeah. are you talking to me? Like, go, go celebrate. But what a wonderful moment for him and all these other people on the field that may not have played, but experienced this in the same way. I saw the Bezpachinkos. And before I was introduced to them, I knew that that was Tim Bezpachinko's dad. <laughs> uncanny resemblance nice. big bear hugs for darlington nagby and any player that he could find his tim's mom walks up tim's rolling around with his whole family it just reminds you of the leadership that you have to have to get to this moment and they remain season ticket holders when he was in toronto working for tfc and in new york working for the league his parents are crew season ticket holders yep. the entire time that's awesome but those are the ohio ties everywhere darlington nagby went he was just showered with affection and attention and calls to come over multiple times in warmups. He went up to you know, parts of the crowd and was like high-fiving, giving hugs to people he knew from the community. Aiden Morris, two hours after the game, all by himself, standing on the field, taking it all in. An Ohio kid that now has two cups to his name. The wise men say post game. I, I went to sleep last night hearing, you know, I'm falling in love with crew in my head, I couldn't get the song out of my head and the, and the visual of those fans sh going back and forth with the entire team in front of them, MLS Cup champions. Jonathan Mensa, yes, I probably should have kept that story to myself, but the first part of that was Mensa was juiced. Like, so excited just to be there and for his guys. Told me the entire season they'd play on the West Coast. He'd be in the locker room before games watching crew That's games awesome. on his phone. Yeah. He was captain in 20, right? He was he the was. one that lifted yep. the trophy. Um, and he's been a special part of that club. So that's really cool to see. I think um, Bradley Wright Phillips mentioned Waylon Francis was in the building. Harrison well. Awful. Yeah, so a bunch of crew guys who have been through a lot with this group specifically. It was cool to see them welcomed back and, and feel like they want to be a part of it. And then just the noise. That's culture. Yeah. That's culture. Yeah. And there are a lot of teams in MLS, a lot of front offices in MLS that still don't really get that. Yeah. That move on quickly and in ways that sort of destroys the the bonds between the players and the club the fabric, and the man. club and the community and i mean credit to tim bezbachenko credit to ownership they have not done that they've really gone out of the way to out of their way to do the opposite of that even when look it had to be painful for jonathan mensa to be moved along from yeah. this team but like you handle, right before the start of the season too yeah you handle it the right way and you end up with situations like this where he comes back for MLS Cup and people want to talk to Andrew Weaver instead. It's just <laughs> well, to, to be fair, the, the guy was like friends with Jonathan from back in the day. He's like, oh, no. Oh, okay. I, yeah. He's like, I have plenty of pictures nice. with Jonathan. Don't worry about it. And so he it wasn't knows quite Jonathan as Mensa, sickening as I made it out to be. So he can take the photo. <laughs> yeah, I, now, that would have been, that would have been a, <laughs> uh, a moment for me on that side. Just the whole, look, if you haven't been to MLS Cup, find a way. Since we've gone from the neutral site to a host, the game has changed so much for the better. And the way that the entire stadium, not just the Nordec, not just the LAFC traveling support, which came in droves as well and was incredibly loud too and made their voices heard even in disappointment, just that occasion and that feeling and, you know, the songs beforehand, the walkout, the fireworks, but then the confetti at the end, all the sort of scenery and eye candy that you get and the emotion wrapped up in all of it, you just got to find a way to go. And the moment when Yaya Boa scores the second goal and the entire place just melts down, 
those are the moments that that you don't ever forget. And I saw to check another box. I saw just oodles of kids there, all in crew stuff, all locked in. And I just thought about man. For me, as a kid, I never had that experience of any sort of championship, any sort of occasion quite on that level as a kid. That is something that they'll never forget and that they'll want to replicate with their kids or their friends or the people that they see tomorrow, next week, two months from now, in 15 years. They'll be talking about that game um, and for good reason. Yeah, you had us talk, I think, last week or you know, in the preview show, sort of big picture to start about like what this game could mean for these two clubs. And I think in loss it's the same. Like there's a lot that you accomplish by getting there, but I talked about a sort of a coronation of this stadium, the rebuild of this club, the reemergence of this club in this market, which is one of the great soccer markets of all time. That's what everything felt like. Right. And you, you talked about it, a fan base that has that fabric connected to the team that got that moment to just completely celebrate it. And now there's a parade on Tuesday. And like they couldn't do that in 2020 and they didn't win in 2015. So it's been a little while. And Columbus is one of those markets where the, where the crew have always been relevant in ways that other MLS teams maybe weren't in the past and are getting there or are already there now. And I think for sort of, we talk about the 2.0s and 3.0s and 4.0s for the crew to have this moment again now is a reaffirmment of where they stand in Ohio, where they stand in Columbus and then where they stand in the league and where this market stands as a soccer market. I mean, it's, one of the places that saved the U.S. national team on the men's side for a number of years. And so I think just to have it all go the way it went, to play that soccer in that moment, to give your fans that just complete relief of like, we came, we showed up, and we delivered. And to have that experience and that celebration, which for now will be weeks in that city, is pretty special. Yeah, I was going to say where Columbus stands in the global picture as well, because we we can't overlook the fact that Cucho has played his way like for real into the Colombian national team based upon his performances for the crew over the past 18 months. Prime age striker for a top 20 national team. Colombia didn't used to call up MLS players five, six years ago. Diego Chara. Yeah, right? Like Diego Chara should have had 60 caps for Colombia. He got three. None since coming to MLS. So that... Diego Rossi, who's a you know a fringe Uruguay international, maybe he could play his way into that team as well. So it's a, I mean, it's a validation of all of it. It's a validation of the entire process of building this league, and it's nice to see, uh, you know, one of the original groups, one of the original yeah. uh, markets, clubs become what they are, and of that original group of teams for a while i think it, it was you know last decade it was sporting kc well it was the galaxy at the start of the decade but then back after the decade it was sporting kc who were the standard bearers and now it's columbus columbus has everything that you want if yeah. you're a soccer fan uh and if you're from elsewhere in one of those markets that's struggling you're looking at that and say that's the blueprint that's how we, and I'm going to segue into like the best thing I saw was the way the Columbus crew played. Mm -hmm. And that's because of Wilfred Nance. And they got Wilfred Nance because, you know, Tim Bezbachenko and the front office, they moved on from Caleb Porter last year. And that team uniformly did not play like this. And they knew they needed to go in a different direction with a different manager. And once it was clear to everyone that Wilfred Nance and ownership in Montreal weren't on the same page and that he could be gotten Columbus moved quickly and decisively. And this is not something that we've seen in MLS before in other leagues, right? If, if Barcelona want Michelle, right. Who just, you know, Corona destroyed them this weekend, they will go out and get Michelle at the end of the year or even in the middle of the year. That's just how it works in other leagues. Now, there's never in MLS going to be the lack of parity that has defined not just La Liga, but most of all of the big five leagues in Europe. So it's never going to be that easy. Even so, you would think there would have been over the years more, all right, what, what can we give you for that guy doing good work with you. What can we, 
it had never really happened. I think maybe the Metro Stars and Chicago Fire when Bob Bradley moved after the 2002 season. I think something had to change hands there, but it wasn't a lot. This was something different. So they went out and they got Wilford Nance specifically because Wilford Nance believes that it's not just about winning. In fact, it's not even primarily about winning. It's about how you play. And it's about entertaining. And it's about empowering the players. And I said on this show, I think two weeks ago, the I have never, there, there are other teams who have played great ball. 2019 LAFC, uh, 2001 Miami Fusion for the longest time were the standard bearers. Those teams never won MLS Cup. And I had never seen a team that's as committed to using the ball to entertain as this crew team are actually go and win MLS Cup. 2017 at Toronto FC, they were great on the ball and they were entertaining, but it wasn't quite like this. Uh, you know, 2009 RSL, they were great on the ball for defensive purposes primarily. This is something different. This is, you know, throwing caution to the wind. <laughs> I mean, Steven Marrera is pocketing Dennis Buanga on one side of the field, and then he's making like delayed third man runs into the box on the other side of the field. They're, they're moving LAFC, who's a great defensive team, pulling them side to side, opening gaps so that your center backs, who are converted fullbacks, can hit through balls. We're getting the, the wing backs forward. We're dropping the number nine deep into the half spaces to just try to confuse the, the center backs who are Jesus Maria, who's a really good center back. And talk about a guy who could play his way into the Columbia national team setup. He's one of them. And Giorgio Chiellini, who's literally one of the best center backs in the history of this game. They had trouble tracking Alexandra Matan who the crew were going to get rid of 12 months ago. Well, for now, I said, no, keep him around. He's got something I can work with. Matan wasn't awesome on the day, but he was very good. And his movement was key time and time again to every series sequence of possession upfield into the final third that the crew had. Um, that's the best thing I saw because earlier in this year, a lot of people were pointing at, the numbers and saying there's no longer a correlation between possession and winning in MLS. And frankly, it was true, right? From about 2005 to 2020, uh, really 2019, the correlation between possession and points per game grew stronger and stronger and stronger every year, basically, in MLS. And I'll, I'll admit, I I am a fan of possession teams. I like teams that want to use the ball. I respect teams that want to play against the ball. I understand it is a winning tactic. It can absolutely be beautiful, um, but give me the possession teams first of all. That fell off a cliff in 2020 and hasn't really recovered. It's become more of a quick transitions Bundesliga style soccer where you're either winning the ball at midfield or you're clearing the ball off the goal line. Like that, that is what MLS has been veering toward and was there going to be a place for Wilfred Nance's idea of how soccer could be played and I think we saw over the course of his time in Montreal that there clearly was but there was always going to be like aha but yeah can you win the big one can you go out and win MLS Cup playing like that. Well, maybe they could do it if they went out and they got Busquets and they got Messi and they got Jordi Alba, but you need players of that level. You can't just take MLS players and get them to the level where they're so good with the ball that no one who plays against the ball against them can knock them out of their rhythm. You can't do that. They did it. It's the best thing I saw this weekend. It's the best thing I've seen in MLS in a long time. And you bring up, you going back to the fusion and some of the teams in between. We've had teams that have tried to get to this point and most of them have opted out of it in the biggest games. Yep. I Either mean, they've Tata, lost. Tata opted 100%. out of it in 2018. Yeah. Toronto at times in 16 and 17. Yep. Um, Portland as well under Caleb Porter in big games, especially in 2015 to go and win MLS Cup. Those were the teams that were Greg sort Berhalter of... Greg Berhalter against Jesse Marsh in those 2015 playoffs. Yeah. Yep. Those were the teams that were the example, and they threw a wrench or didn't didn't trust it in the biggest moments, didn't believe that they could win, 
got nervous, whatever word you want to use, Columbus never did that. They never did that coming into this. They never did it on the road in the postseason. Like the last two games, they played away. In, an, in a league in which the home team is heavy favorites, and we've talked about it over and over again in this playoffs, they went to Orlando and they won, and they went to Cincinnati and they won. They went down 2-0 in Cincinnati, didn't change anything, didn't readjust. And then to come out here and just have the belief and confidence to be who you are. And LAFC, I thought, threw a decent wrench at the beginning and played a little bit of higher line than I expected, and crew sort of settled in. But there was no point in this game where they weren't going to play that way. And I think that's a credit to everything that's gone on that that was always understood internally and externally one of the things that i think about in terms of how a club is run ultimately it does come down from ownership of what what they want a club to look like and also what they're willing to pay for in the terms of players and approach but also the investment in a guy like wolf renunci and all the things that draw him to columbus so i want to give credit of course to tim bezbachinko he is the brain behind so many of these amazing projects that we've seen in mls over recent years but certainly given all the context around the crew to give credit to Dr. Pete Edwards, who was a part of this club in a different way before becoming a part of ownership, who's been connected to the club forever, and the Haslams, who built Lower.com Field and created this training facility and put the money there to go get a guy like Cucho in a market where around MLS, people might say, well, we, don't, we just don't have those funds. Can't go do it. Not only don't we have the funds, we can't attract a Cucho, but to have a project that could attract all these top professionals on whatever level that is whether it's players or executives or coaches certainly and then to put it all together and to believe in it and say no 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 don't get more pragmatic stay philosophical stay committed to what you are and what you want to be like that courage has to run throughout the entire organization and by god when Wilfred Nancy says we're going to have courage and impossible as opinion anybody's going to believe if that he the had man is given you ah! if he had given you that speech before the trophy presentation do you think you would have done it do you think you would have ah! you would have well i was going to say wolf renancy would have stolen the trophy <laughs> win or lose wolf renancy would have got a touch <laughs> just a little bit of something that's just it, mentally that's where he would have been at but yeah i mean it it truly is it truly is inspirational what they did and how they did it um dave before we dig into the nitty gritty of the game best thing you saw I think just to everything we just said, it was Nancé throwing Jan de May over after the second goal. Like the celebration <laughs> of it worked. And we have spent almost this entire day in our group chat sending clips of when Odmanson hit that ball to Yaboa in other games. Yeah, we've talked about how it's it's not it's not patterns of pay, play, it's principles of play for the Columbus crew. And it was both on that second goal because apparently this pattern with Amundsen hitting a disguised through ball between the opposing right back and right center back, this is something they work on in training all the time. And they know anytime there's an overload on, on the right side, they can work it back to Amundsen and that is on. And uh, a crew fan found a clip of him hitting that ball. Uh, he overcooked it just a bit in the first hell is real game of the year. And then another, a buddy of mine, Elliot McKinley, who works for, uh, who does great work for American soccer analysis. And he's a crew fan as well. Congratulations, <laughs> Elliot. Um, he found a, a clip of it. They scored a goal against Minnesota, the late equalizer in the league's cup on that same pattern of play. The principles underlying it though, are courage and, center backs have to be able to play long for Wilfred Nance. And that doesn't mean lumping into the channel. That means you have to be able to play a through ball. And that's why, you know, he tends to go for converted fullbacks just <laughs> traditionally are better on the ball than what we ask for of our center backs. And if there's a long-term knock-on effect of this, I hope this makes MLS managers, MLS next pro USL college high school, academy, all have different expectations for what the game could look like, different standards for what the game could look like in terms of being playing out of the back. Those guys can be playmakers, dude. They're soccer players. Yeah, so everything Doyle said, it was, it's one of the great goals in MLS Cup history. It's the best goal in MLS Cup history. Yeah, I didn't have the full brain space to go through the best everyone. team goal in mls okay history. yeah that's an easy one um it's 11 passes i think from mm -hmm. right to left it's morera who steps in and farsi rotates back to start the play and columbus hadn't really gone short short long that much and it wasn't really because they play through midfield to get there but they suck lafc into one side then you play across 
We've talked about it a lot today. Um, it's Matan who rotates all the way deep. And Mario doesn't know if he should go with him or not and kind of gets lost in no man's land. It's Cucho's gravity on the far side of the field that keeps Palacios and Chiellini back, that keeps Yaboa on side. And it's the crew's understanding of how to open that space then where the center mids don't go into that gap and try and pick up the ball. Matan drops deep. That pulls Murillo out. Hollings heads on an island. Yoboa knows exactly what's happening. You talked about uh, in the group chat that he had tried to sort of fake that run a couple times in the game. The whole first half, they're they're setting this up. It's always a threat. And he'd take three, four hard steps and then pull out. And there were other moments Yoboa would get that look with either Matan because when Matan drops, they'll take the easy ball a lot. And they'll just play outside of the pressure from the central midfielder into Matan's feet. And then he and Yoboa will combine. And there were multiple times where he just puts his hand up, Yoboa. He says, no, I'm going to show this, but don't play it. Takes a couple steps, comes back. Hollingshead sort of puts that in his memory banks over and over. Okay, this is a run I'm going to have to deal with, but he's deking me right now. He might not actually make that run. And then you have the threat of Matan. It's like, are they going to play the easy ball? You lull them into sort of that defensive rest, that moment of defensive shape where it's like, okay, just rotate because this ball is going to play to be Matan. It's not going to be high pressure. We're not going to go fast. And to your point in the in the pregame, your column, and we've been talking about this all year, when the crew go, they go. It's they are avalanche. direct. It yeah. is. We're going now. He makes the run. Hollingshead is asleep. And the pass is it's so it's perfect. perfect. The pass is absurd. It's That's, so perfect. Yeah. So it's like the, the, the team concept. And just moments ago, when they draw the penalty, it's Morris and Nagby playing through the middle. One, two. So I think you have... Tillman and Acosta sort of worried about that. So they're not going to come out. Murillo doesn't know then how far am I supposed to track Matan. So he's slightly out of position. And then there are soccer players that you watch who have a complete understanding of how to use the entire part of your foot, of what pass takes what part of the foot and what you can hit it with. Odmanson, perfect in this. The texture on the ball to keep Maxime Crepeau on his line for a second, but then it's curling out so Yaboa doesn't have to break stride, but into Yaboa so Crepeau doesn't think he can get there. And Yaboa finishes it to perfection. And then you just have like, oh my God, they've scored two in five minutes now. The crowd is on their side. And it just felt like that avalanche on LAFC, an LAFC team that had held the fort through the entire postseason, right? They hadn't conceded since the second game on the road against Vancouver. They didn't do it against Seattle on the road. They were able to keep that crowd quiet by not giving up goals. Now Cucho scores on the penalty. Okay, they're thinking, fine, whatever. We get to halftime at 1-0. We can manage this. Buanga's on the field. We will score. And then that goal in that style, the way they played, it just felt like it was inevitable that the crew were going to win that game. Did you see the slow-mo of Yaboa coming to the corner that the crew put out with all the rain falling on him and the imagery of it and the emotion in his face? I did I mean, it was one that. of the images of MLS Cup history for me that we'll see forever and ever and ever because of the elements and the occasion and the Nordic behind him and all the context that your brain will immediately recall when it sees that. The other thing in, within this play is how hard they make you shift in those possession moments. If you watch this play, how far LAFC has shifted. It's all just shifted. weaponizing Darlington Nagby's penchant for square balls. That's what yeah. it is. They found a way to do it. Yeah. I mean, he went 52 to 54, 52 to 54 passing. And if you look at the chalkboard, you cannot tell what direction the crew were attacking, but they made it. They made it work. Well, and that's the shift too. That's what sets it all up. They said we're going to draw you to this side. Yep. And LAFC throughout this whole postseason, their strength in shutouts. I thought one of the things was because they're so athletic that yep. they can move their shape with you. You have to move it so fast and have a really clear understanding of once we have them here, we've got to get it there, and then have the quality to take advantage. And nobody else had that. Yeah, we talked. They hadn't. We talked a lot coming into the game about what LAFC had had to deal with against Houston and Seattle, and the similarities. But then the next level that Columbus can go to is like Corey Baird's not dropping in and playmaking. There are six to eight players in this Columbus team that can pop up in any position. Yeah. Marrera played left forward at times in this game. He had the header on Diego Rossi's cross when he went in. Farsi's getting to the end line. There is a moment where Farsi and, Fer and Marrera link up in the box. And you're like, why are both of you in there? Odmanson can step in and do whatever you need. Nagby can drop in and cover. Yaboa rotates in a ton, and it can be Matan or Cucho or Rossi who goes out wide, and then the three of them can play all three positions. So it's it's another. it was another step that LAFC had to go of like, Okay, we can crowd in midfield. We can close down Bossy when he goes. 
Coco's going to come inside, but the other options in Quinones and Baird couldn't add to that. And now you had eight players you had to deal with and you have to deal with it for the 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you could, yeah, there are times in this game where LAFC played it well. They made a couple LAFC mistakes. was really good for a lot of it. Yeah. But they made a couple mistakes they couldn't yeah. afford. They made mistakes we haven't seen them made make. I think part of that was lack of performance. And then part of that is Columbus forcing it. Hollingshead has been a rock yeah. for them defensively. I don't blame him as much on the Yaboa run because he, he doesn't was know defending what's going on. He's defending half the field against a guy who's going to outrun him. But Yaboa megged him before that. Yaboa beat him a couple times. This is a guy who's had to be a rock for them. And he got beat 1v1. And you saw Palacios be really good again, but make some mistakes. You saw Kellen Acosta, I think, uncomfortable in possession in ways he normally isn't because it's coming so fast from Columbus. So just tactically speaking, Columbus, they are a high-pressing team not to press and immediately create opportunities, though they will do that if it's right there on a platter. It's press to uh, get on the ball. They want to have 60% possession. They're at their best when they have 60% possession, uh, but also to take the other team out of their rhythm. To take Just like the Red Bulls play they, the way they play in order to turn everything into a Red Bull game, the crew play the way they play in order to turn everything into a crew game. And they did that in this game for about 75, 80 minutes. And then, you know, kitchen sink time from LAFC and they're champions. So, of course, they didn't go out, you know, without anything. Like, they really pushed it at the end. But the big thing that Columbus did was they pushed both Matan and Rossi a little bit higher in their off-ball positioning, and that completely cut off any sort of distribution from LAFC's fullbacks to Ilya Sanchez. And I looked at halftime, Hollings had, had completed one pass to Ilya in the first half. Palacios had completed one pass to Ilya in the first half. Well, the way LAFC play, it's not necessarily supposed to be Acosta or Tillman who drop in and become that fulcrum because they have to push and get pressure higher upfield. They can't let Columbus just get into that, you know, clockwork canary or clockwork black and gold, if you want to call it <laughs> that. Um, so they're kind of being tasked with other jobs and you can't cover all of the field. It had to have been Carlos Vela dropping in as a false nine. So you just, if you're the fullbacks, you skip the line going from fullback to defensive midfield to attack, you skip the line and you just go full back to attack. And it had to be Vela, but he wasn't dropping in. And so all of this ended up putting, I think, Acosta in a really, and Tillman yeah. into really uncomfortable positions. And there were no real adjustments from LAFC until, you know, midway through the second half where they started throwing caution to the wind. And full credit to, Mario in like we picked Unreal. on him a little bit in that Unreal second stat. goal. Yeah. No, I like I thought he was the best player on the field. I actually thought Jesus Mario was the best player on the field in the game or Yaya Boa who was crucial on both goals and just had a great game and I thought neutralized Ryan Howling's head as well. Um but it was just you know if you put out this fire over here, your LAFC, you're starting a four alarm blaze over there. And by the time you're putting that one out, they're going up the gut over here. And it just ended up all moving way too quickly for them, as great as they are, uh, to handle it. And it didn't feel like a 2-1 game. No. It just felt like a 3-0 game. The coach, he deserves all the credit, said Alexandra Matan in the locker room celebrating afterwards. You need to have balls, sorry for my language, to play this type of football. <laughs> This is from a guy who I, Doyle mentioned off the top, like he was out on loan last year and it was just assumed he was, his MLS career was done. Yes. Fine. You no goals mistakes. or assists in two years. Yeah. Here's the quote from Matan on that particular subject. Even in my best dreams, I wouldn't imagine this thing right now. So last year, this time, like in December, I was in a depression. I had an injury on loan. My career was not going in the right direction for me. Right now, it's unbelievable. I have no words. Mo Farsi, who played an incredible game at right back and became the choice laid on, even despite the quality of Julian Gressel and the amount of allocation money invested in midseason. Quote from Farsi, never in my life would I have thought of this. Never in my life would I have thought about playing in MLS and winning MLS. It just shows you that you have to dream big and be limitless. Impossible is an opinion. 
Ale Quebecois. I mean, oh, Mo Farsi. I mean, we've spent a lot of time talking about that second goal and justifiably. The first goal was Will Fernandez Ball as well. Mm-hmm. Like, if the, the, the thing I've banged on about in my columns and on the show all year is they will literally put a foot on the ball if they're not getting pressed enough. They desperately want to be pressed. They want you to bring your front line up, your midfield up, and your back line up. And that is where the directness comes from with this crew team because Nancy says to every single player on his team, I believe in your ability to beat the guy in front of you, whether it's hitting the right pass to feet or into a pocket or even to, you know, a guy on the run, or it's just beating them off the dribble. And in the buildup to what eventually became the first goal via penalty, LAFC is not pressing anybody. So Camacho stands there 75, 80 yards from goal, puts his foot on the ball, just literally stops the ball and stops everything until LAFC bring everyone up. And then boom, 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 give and go, give and go, give and go out wide to Yaboa. I thought it was a smart pullback of a cross to the top of the box instead of into the six, because if it's into the six, I think that's get, that gets yeah. cleared. So bringing it back to the top of the box, you're either getting a late runner. Either way, you're forcing them to make a play. Um, it was fantastic. We're going to talk call in a second. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to go there yet. Let's but stay with the beautiful part. Just on, on the conversation, we talked about it, but Seattle playing home against LAFC, the mental clock for Yaimar and Reagan goes, and they're like, I shouldn't be on the ball anymore. Yeah. And they either charge forward into pressure or they just get rid of it. And Camacho doesn't have that. There's multiple times in this game where Aiden Morris is just standing still in the middle of the field saying, if no one's going to move, I'm not going to give up the ball. A lot of players are uncomfortable because that's just not how you're raised and that's not how you play the sport. It's on your foot and then it needs to be Aiden off your Aiden Morris foot. is so much better on the ball now than, than he was yeah. two years ago. It's unreal. There was a, once LAFC started to apply pressure late in the game, there's a few times where they play into and out of Morris, out wide to Farsi or Yaboa, whoever it is. And the ball's in the right direction, right? He's like leading players. He's putting it on the right foot. And in the past, we've seen him make the right decision, but not play the ball in the correct way. He had one wayward one in the first half to Farsi. And Camacho like applauds him when he does it, actually, saying like, yep, that's the right ball. You'll hit it correctly as this game goes along. We don't care. Um, but yeah, that that's that part where going into MLS Cup, it was like both these teams have faced this opponent, but at a little bit of a lower level coming into this, what would you do against the peak of this? And LAFC didn't have the answers for the added things that Columbus can do and being comfortable in possession, waiting for that pressure, having more rotating pieces. I mean, one of the things with Nagby with that sideward, sideways passing is it's all layoffs to guys who are coming at speed already. So instead of going on... And, and who of, have options based on the way that they've... right. The so, movement in front of them has evolved because you know Darlington won't lose the ball. And when you get a bunch of players on an island, right, when you get a defending team to spread out and come 1v1 like Doyle talked about, that's your opportunity to beat someone on the half turn because they don't know which way you're going. You have the option. Instead of doing that, Nagby lays off to Morris or one of the center backs or wing backs coming past him already at pace. They get the ball into their feet and they're already going forward. And that's one of the things they've been able to weaponize off him and it makes you comfortable because you can trust that ball into his feet for the guys who at times maybe you don't want to be pressured and you're tired of it and you're tired of playing through it. And it takes away that weakness. So it was awesome. And that's what happens on the goal is then Morris and Nagby just play through the middle. They get it out wide to Yaboa. And you see for the crew, if Chris Ramirez is in the game, I think they do put it in the six. And we saw that against Orlando. Yeah. They don't play that ball across the six because they don't have the options. Ramirez comes in, creates the goal because he's in the six. But it's an understanding of the personnel, what guys want, how it works. And like you said, he plays it back. It just forces Palacios to make a play. And for LAFC, if you're going to play inside your defensive third, every mistake becomes a goal-scoring chance. And so that play could have happened 40 yards from goal in a normal game where you're not sitting inside. But every single mistake becomes a fire drill because it's happening right around your goal or it's a penalty kick. We can do the penalty. I want to do the calls and a uh, look that – that to me is so secondary to all the other things that the crew did in this game. And we'll get to them. I, I want to talk Nagby and Morris a little bit more because I think all the things you're talking about with inviting pressure Doyle are reliant on those two and sort of an intrinsic understanding between both of what spaces to occupy, how to present themselves as options to the players around them. And then the chemistry between each other once they get on the ball. Yeah. I mean, you can invite pressure when you know, Darlington Nagby is going to be standing somewhere where you can play an easy pass to him looking you in the eye. 
And it doesn't matter how many players are around him. When you watch him play live, it is a completely different experience than watching him play on television. It is, you know, you talk about pausing the game. That's what I take away from this match of watching Darlington. It's like, there's just a bunch of moments where he just hits pause on the game and like the planets are revolving around him and motion is happening and he's just sort of surveying and he's the sun and he's like, all right, well, I'll, I'll wait for my moment. Come try to get this ball. Two steps, pass, gone. Come try to pressure the ball. Oh, okay, you're out of shape. Now we're moving and we're gone. Come to me. You can't get it. The one time LAFC scores because he gave up the ball uncharacteristically. Yeah. And I don't think he was 100% by any means. Yeah. I mean, you saw with the early exit, but it seemed like to me most of the second half, he was kind of laboring. He wasn't pushing. Yeah. He wasn't trying to burst forward That's as when we it felt sometimes see. They lost a little bit of the control was he was not touching the ball as often as he normally is to calm everything down once LAFC started to throw numbers forward. And then the the embrace, final whistle embrace, him and Morris. Dreams. Two Ohio guys. If anyone doesn't know, and if anyone doesn't know this, which I can't imagine you got through MLS Cup without it, uh, Darlington Nagby got COVID before the 2020 final, and he called Aiden Morris immediately, who was going to step into his spot and said, I believe in you, you can do this. Aiden Morris went out and had one of the all-time MLS Cup performances. He outplayed Nico Ladero as a 19-year-old. Yeah, was 19 it? years at that time? 27 days. Yeah. He was the, the youngest starter ever in MLS Cup at that point. I think Tavon Gray beat him the next year, but like 19 years old, and he pocketed Nico Ladero. I mean, he played in the Big Ten, so he kind of understood the level coming into oh, it. He's on. now the second youngest... I'll tell you, Big Ten MLS is more of a winner. soccer conference than it is basketball or football. Well, we're going to find that out, huh? In the Super Draft. <laughs> December 19th, everyone. MLS season pass. Here's a stat. Uh, Aiden Morris, only one player, has won two MLS Cups at a younger age. Landon? And of course, that's Landon Donovan. Yeah. So, it, so that's the moment, like, coming into this game is, and now Morris and Nagby get to do it together. And what they both do is vital to the team in different ways, and it only works with both of them in the group. And... We have this trade window open. I look back through last year, the trades. Arter was traded in this window to Houston, was phenomenal this year, and was a linchpin to everything Greg Berhalter did. And at times last year when he came back from injury, it felt like the crew could only stay compact enough to, to compete if he was on the field. They traded him. You come in. Aiden Morris is the tone setter. He's the one who covers ground to attack going forward, especially out of possession. We've talked about him in the counter press and what he does and the way he amps up the game. And then Nagby's the one who creates the pause and sort of fills in a lot of the gaps. Morris was phenomenal on the right side, defend, or LAFC, defending LAFC's right side. He's the one who steps in and wins a ton of the tackles against Oliveira on Hollingshead when they tried to get involved in the play. And then he's good going forward in possession. In that first 20 minutes, you saw the counter pressing of like, there was a few sort of hopeful balls from Columbus that got deflected and everyone that LAFC deflected landed on a crew player's foot because they're all forward and they're all around the ball. So they're all forward, but also the crew definitely drill how to win second balls. They're spacing specifically on second balls. If you go back and watch that game, watch how many headed clearances end up being instead of 15 yards yeah. they're only five they're knockdowns they're knockdowns yeah. because they like they want to keep the game small it almost gets them in trouble sometimes it, it definitely gets them in yeah. trouble sometimes <laughs> camacho had the but one it, he knocked down in the open field it goes well i think that was just a misplay i okay. think he was trying to play that one back to schulte but like it does go back to courage right the courage to say okay we we drill how to win a clearance and like specifically how to um, keep a clearance small and controlled because we don't want to let the other team re reset. We know that once we have possession, we can reset and we can break anybody down off the of possession. And that goes back to the Nagby thing. Nagby has been a great player in MLS for 13 years now. He will go down as I think one of the iconic players of this era. David and I have had this conversation for a while. Like we rate, Darlington Nagby for the things he does well. It's always been frustrating to watch him not drive the game forward. It has always driven me nuts. I think if if he had that gene in him, um, he like he wouldn't have been in MLS the past dozen years. No, he, you'd be he, talking about a U.S. team that not only qualified for twenty eighteen World Cup but was like a contender. Yeah, if he could kill teams going forward into the attack with his ball possession, with how much ground he covers. It would be game changing, but he has found his spot he in has the found, right teams. And, and we saw the difference between this year and last year 
with Colum- the last two years with Columbus. Because not to say that Columbus is failing to qualify for um, for the playoffs last year or the year before were Nagby's fault, but with the position he was playing in four two three one, he needed to drive that game forward more it became more about his ability or the ability of someone in the center of the pitch to actually do that job time and time again during the game the way Ache Ache does for the Houston Dynamo this year he doesn't have that gene he's never had that gene if he had that gene he would have been playing for Atletico Madrid with Ache Ache so when I was kind of joking before about them weaponizing Nagby's penchant for playing square balls and back passes like I was only kind of joking like it's actually more kind of true the way that this team is set up and we saw it on the goals but we also saw it on those knockdowns we saw it on those clearances and because they're so precise and so confident in their ability to win those clearances you took away what was LAFC's best weapon was transition moments and we, we should, I guess, tra- transition into talking about LAFC a little bit. Like, they have whittled away. Four years ago, they were this team yeah. that we're talking Which about. Which was part of the reason people said you can't win. Right. You can't win MLS Cup because if LAFC with Vela at his peak, with and Diego, Diego Rossi, Rossi at Eddie his- Atueste, who I am dying right. to be back in MLS this coming year because he hasn't, well, he's got hurt, but like he hasn't had as good a run of it in Brazil as I think we all expected. Like they had a Jose Cifuentes, who we thought would start a World Cup for Ecuador. Mark Anthony K, yeah. who actually did start in World Cup for right. Canada and, it, you know, was at the absolute peak of his powers. Trundolo has understandably so mitigated basically all risk with how LAFC play. And just like Wilfred Nance in terms of having players that fit his philosophy and ideology, that's what Toronto has done. And it has worked and it has worked against really good teams. Um, I, I don't like watching it as much. Um, and I think we saw the upside of that or the downside of the mitigation of risk and the, uh, the sort of averse to using the ball is that once Columbus took away their plan A, their ability to get out and transition, they either had to take completely wild risks, which is what Mario's step was that eventually it led to the goal, or just find a completely different way that they were uncomfortable with. There was no ability to, um, to sort of throw a, a change up at the crew. And that's the way the, that's why the game ended the way it did. Yeah. I wanted to, one thing before we get through LAFC yeah, though, sorry. is on the Morris Nagby thing, Darlington Nagby is the Ohio native. He came into MLS pre really Academy homegrown setup. He went to Akron, and got drafted, but I think in bringing him back, you have sort of given a model of like, this is what a great player out of Ohio can look like. And I think he has taken that on. It goes to the story about calling Aiden Morris. Aiden Morris, a crew academy homegrown. Not a Columbus native. Let's be real. They went out and recruited him. But like, that's part of setting it up. But they created a pathway for him to get into the first team. And so I think you have the 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 two examples there of what this club has rebuilt themselves on. They were awarded Academy of the Year today. So they won MLS Cup with Cucho, with high-level signings, with Nance, with everything. And then a day later, we're awarded Academy of the Year. And a lot of that is new for Columbus. They didn't really believe that they had the market to develop the players, blah, blah, blah. That's no longer true. And so I think you see the greatness of what they are building in that midfield of like Nagby would have been there. That would have been his career. But then they bring him back around. He can be a face, a leader. And I think you hear it from a lot of the young players there of like, he's an easy voice to go and talk to and, and ask questions and be around. And then what he's done for Morris and now what they can do for each other and make the game easier for each other is awesome. Um, but back to LAFC. Can I just throw in a tweet here? Sure. Because we're probably an hour into this show. And I want to say, it doesn't feel like it. I want to say that we've said Denny Buanga's name. Yeah. Twice. So I would say that closing of the first half, 2-0, LFC almost score, right? It's uh, yeah. I think Hollingshead almost... starts the sort of starts the moving on the right, and then it ends up 
flipping back. Yeah. But the key the is one time it really felt like, oh, they 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 figured a way through. So Buanga comes inside on that play, and yeah. it's Oliveira and Vela down the left wing. And in what you were talking about of that curveball, LAFC were uncomfortable with that. So they never went back to it. Because that's 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 your your solve there is okay, Marrera and Farsi know where Buanga is. There, there's a bump on him every time he's near the ball. Anytime he squares up one of them, the other one is right there as a secondary help because he beat the first man a couple times where either Farsi got his body back in front, he earns a foul early in the game on the line, or Marrera or Farsi are recovering to help the other one that has gotten beat 1v1. So Buanga goes inside. Everyone sort of loses their marks for a second. Olivero gets to the end line, squares it back, and it's almost an own goal against Columbus. So there's your solution. Go back to it. They just hadn't done it all year. Olivero is just not comfortable going back across the field and being involved. And Vela is not a difference maker in a lot of parts of the field anymore. And what we saw against Houston was like there was flashes of it in a home game against the worst opponent. But he what he didn't score a goal and he didn't create a goal off of that. And so that's sort of the limitations of LAFC. And I think I was I, I was texting with a coach through the game and he was like, I just thought Chirundle would throw more wrinkles in there. They didn't have wrinkles. Right as the season has gone along, they've played one way more and more consistently mm -hmm. towards the end. You can't do something your players are uncomfortable with or incapable of in the biggest moment, as my dad always says for triathlons. You don't you don't do something on race that you've never practiced before. So like you couldn't do it, and they didn't have another option. And part of that I think is to roster build of like, you know, if Columbus was down, they bring Ramirez on. It changes their shape a little bit. They don't really have those guys on the team. They brought Bogush in as a little bit more of a threat out of midfield, but there's not a, a, a player on the bench, a Gareth Bale, to come in and, and say And Mario him. Gonzalez was supposed to be sort of yeah. a guy who could change the way they It was they supposed play. to be a Chicharongo for them, right? That's yeah. what they thought they were going to get. In or like a, you know, maybe not quite a Chicharongo, well, but like Chicha. some of the things that... They signed him as a TAM player originally, yeah, I right? That's, so I guess that's, that's fair. That's the expectation. Paul hit us up, said, probably not the best thing I saw. The most surprising thing was the crew's defending of Bawanga. Saw so after the game that Marrera and Bawanga used to be on the same team in France. Yeah, they were chatting up the whole game. Yeah, and look, before the game, Marissa said, I'm going to kick him. And he, he, he didn't necessarily kick him, but I thought the way that they bracketed Bawanga and using both players onto the sideline at all times, to use the sideline to defend against him, didn't let him come inside, didn't let him pick up. You know, once he gets that momentum, it's so impossible to stop him. And you see this in person, too. He's huge. Yeah. He's like a truck. Well, even he's so strong and athletic, and his first two steps are lightning. And if you let him have those un- bumped unmolested he's just like you're gonna see the backside of him there was they that, never got to that point the crew's early corner kick which like gets popped out and farsi just plays like a simple ball back to schulte and the acceleration from buanga makes it like a high pressure moment out of nowhere because from midfield to the box he just explodes and you're like oh yeah that's that guy and vancouver struggled in their five or three in the back in their spacing between the guys on the right side, and Buanga was able to pick up speed, and then he can do whatever he wants at that point. And that's where Columbus was able to adjust, like you said, and always have a bump. Marrera's recovery runs a few times to get in between Buanga and the ball, to stay strong, to draw a foul, to find a way to play it to a teammate, and the help from Farsi. I mean, one of the stories of the night to, you know, eliminate a guy who had 38 goals and quote-unquote eliminate. He still scored. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Patrick Schulte who is the youngest winning goalkeeper in the most cup of all time, by the way, almost snuffed out the one big chance. But then, you know, it's the Thanos thing with Buanga. It's just like inevitable. Yeah, it would fall to his feet and he would finish at a near angle. Uh, the other thing I would say about this game that I thought was poetic for the crew was that all year long, the boogeyman for them, the monster in the basement, like every time you open the door and it's dark down there, and you're like, oh, we have a lead and it's late in the game. They over and over fell down the stairs. Yeah. And they had to confront that in the biggest game of their season with everything on the line in front of their home fans. And they gave up the goal to make it 2-1. And it was just sort of like, this is it. This is the litmus test. Did you figure it out? Did you learn? Can you stick to being yourself? Or, to your point, Doyle, when it got a little choppier, managing the moment better and being more mature in that moment. I thought Christian Ramirez and Julian Gressel and Kevin Molino and others the guys that came off the bench, Sean Zawadzki, showed a level of maturity and understanding of that moment that the crew... Gressel tried to play tight one time when he won it back, and it backfired, and the next time he put his foot... Yeah. Oh, he was ball. auditioning yeah. for punting. Yeah, for yeah. sure. He's like, Brandon Aubrey, yeah, if right. anyone needs a kicker. <laughs> but they closed it out, and they kind of got that monkey off their back in the biggest moment. 
Uh, real quick, and then we'll maybe put a bow on the game itself and and kind of move on to what comes next. Just the calls. Uh, it's penalty for me. It doesn't matter that it hits his shoulder. The law two or three years ago did take into account close range deflections as a part of the math and determining a handball. That language has been gone for a few years now. As I've said on Instant Replay over and over, you can go watch the show. Uh, and if you do watch the show, you've heard me say this many times. Basically, a player takes a risk of their hand or arm being in a natural position. And if it hits the hand or arm, that's the risk you took. To your point about having to defend in sort of fire alarm situations, like the advantage goes to the attacking team because they put you in that position. If it hits your hand, it's a penalty. It hit him in the hand, and it's a penalty. And Armando Villarreal was in a perfect position. Just like it was MLS Cup Day, pinnacle your profession for these players, it was pinnacle day for the referees, and they earned their way into that match. You don't get given MLS Cup. Pro doesn't just hand that out willy-nilly. And Armando's had, I believe, two of the last three. He is a wonderful referee. I thought he had an amazing game. He was balling on the field afterwards. You could just tell what it meant to him to not just have the honor to do the game and have earned that, but I thought have refereed a really, a really good game. People wanted the second yellow on Timothy Tillman. For me, it was not a second yellow. I thought the Rossi one was barely a foul. Rossi like flips himself. Well, they're up also in the air. so close together. Yeah, there just wasn't there really wasn't much contact. Certainly not enough for a second yellow. Managed the moment. Good job there. Vela flirted with a red. He actually does catch with the straight leg on Cucho, but it's so glancing that I think degree of contact tells you, okay, well, that's that's more of a yellow card. And then I, I thought Kevin Lino could have got a penalty late, but it's a coulda, not a shoulda. Yeah, we so, debated that one before. Yeah, the show. so on, on all merits, whether it's Armando or his ARs or Kevin Stott, who was refereeing his seventh MLS Cup as the VAR, credit to those guys. Thought the, they did a, a wonderful job. The only miss was leading up to that. The Christian, Ram yeah, Christian Ramirez was, yeah, he was fouled. Yeah, but the foul there, you it's can't, outside the box. You, you can't, can't review, review mm -hmm. and you're letting the play run because it looks like Columbus is into the attack. It looks like they have the advantage. And then Molino gets the touch. I think Molino gets a touch. Palencia comes through and then takes it off his foot while he comes through him. So that's why I don't think it's a penalty. But like, in essence, Armando Villarreal was correct and the advantage was there. Mm -hmm. All right, let's uh, let's sort of wrap some things up. Maybe some from the LAFC side. This is a, a funny tweet. Jeremy Peterman. Obviously feeling some uh, some joy at LAFC's pain. He says, Trundolo becoming Trundelusional was the best thing that he saw. Trundolo did say after this game, quote, did the crew deserve to win tonight? Yes, they were the better team tonight. Are they the better team overall? And I'm sort of paraphrasing that quote a little bit. No. That's an interesting thing to say, and I, I understand his point of view in some ways. What do you want him to say? I know. Yeah. Are you supposed to denigrate his team? No, he's not. Now, what was the question? Uh, I'm not even sure. So that's the part where it's like, I don't think someone asked him, are you guys better than Columbus? And that's where he chooses to go with the answer. It was probably, if, did, did you deserve, I mean, it's probably something about the three yeah. finals. If, if I'm the head coach of LAFC, I've got Buanga on my team. I've got Chiellini. I'll believe that I'm better than every other team in the league. Right. And on performance, there's a lot of argument there that they are, but I, I just, you have to go back to how dominant Columbus was, especially in the first half. It is one of the great halves in MLS Cup history. 2020, Columbus against Seattle is close. 2020 is odd. There's not yeah. fans there. It's a whole thing, whatever. Going back through history, yeah. we talked about it. 2017 at times for Toronto. But again, you go to what did you look like in the regular season and how free did you play in MLS Cup? Probably wasn't on the same level. Um, I think the other big one that stood out to us was 08 Columbus maybe. And then all the way back to 03, but this was Columbus being perfect in what they did for a full 45 minutes to open the game. I would argue 55 or 60, and it should have been three or four zero in that open of the second half. And that's where I think it's tough to say that the lead, the team that led the league in scoring that is one of the top two in possession across everything that has gone on the road and won two MLS Cup playoff games, one at the Supporters' Shield winners and the other in extra time against Orlando that was then able to host you and dominate you. It feels hard to believe that they're not the best team in MLS. All right, so let's move on just a little bit and look to the future. We'll take any and all questions you have on MLS Cup. Happy to talk about this one till the cows come home. Tom Bogert, we know that guy, says, so many questions around the future of this LAFC group right now. Club legend Carlos Vela, Kellen Acosta, Diego Palacios, and Giorgio Chiellini are all out of contract. 
I joked about it earlier on in the show, but Denny Bawanga afterwards didn't shut the door on a move back to Europe. You would understand John that. Torrington did. Yeah, well, <laughs> he's like, hold on, hold on, that looks cracked, slammed it shut. But you score 38 goals in a single season. You might start thinking, I either deserve a raise or maybe this is my moment to get a, another big transfer. LAFC would uh, desperately like to prevent both of those. Well, maybe not the raise part, but the transfer part. Uh, Chiellini was wonderful as a representative of loving soccer in Major League Soccer, which was like the best part. Jonathan Smith tweeted us. I saw that I loved a lot as a crew fan, but one of the best things I saw was Giorgio Chiellini in possibly his final game ever, going around to multiple crew players and congratulating them in what seemed like a genuine fashion. Not just a quick high five. He is a class dude, and he desperately wanted to win this game. If you look back at the good moments LAFC had with the ball in this game, including that chance at the end of the first half, it starts with Chiellini hitting a inch perfect one. Th- like he could still play. He it, it's a question of does he want to go through the come back, again? Giorgio? Please, especially because Luis Suarez is going to be in MLS <laughs> next year. His quote post game was, "I don't know if I want to play here, if I want to play for six months or a year, or if not play at all." Those are like his four options. I'm curious what the six months mean. Because in so, theory, you'd think that's going to a European team and playing out a season. Maybe going back to Juventus and, and right. sitting on the bench. And he said, I'm I'm going, I, I'm more interested in the business side of this game than right. the coaching side. And obviously, Juventus has made a habit of bringing legends back to be in their organization to help run the club. You would think that that's where he will end up whenever but, it is time. It would throw out this is an LAFC team that did sign Vela to a contract that expired in July last year. That's fair. So he might mean... Yeah, I'll play for, for LAFC. CONCACAF Champions Cup. No, they're not in there. I know that's the that was tough. Yeah. He's, yeah, I, I think it's important to Just bring him back Cup. for cultural reasons. I, I think that we saw that over the past two years, having a guy with his experience and big games and um, winning stuff has, I think, helped this team overall. And, you know, that's a funny thing to say, given they lost three finals this year. But come on, guys, he, he was great. And there are 25 other MLS teams that would – kill to have the season LAFC just had. So I think he's important. I think Kellen Acosta is important. Uh, I think Maxime Cropo is important. None of those guys are as important as Diego Palacios. That's the one that is the worry from LAFC's perspective because Palacios, and we blew it when we were doing um, yeah, we did. best 11s this year. He should have been third, third or fourth team. Who did we play? As, well, I don't we were scrambling at left back and mistakes were made. Do we do we put Dwan Jones? First team. Oh. No, I thought we had No, we moved Dwan over on first team. Oh left, yeah, Barrio. Then I think Dwan on the s- No, so Dwan was our right and, back, and I think. Kai Wagner was team. our yeah. second team. And I'm I think fine with that. Yeah, we're, yeah, there were some we're galaxy brains there. Anyway, Palacios is huge for them. I know he had the handball in this one. He wasn't great in this one, but he does so much. You know, he's a two way player. He, you know, is honest every single time out you get the same level of commitment from him he's in his prime um he, he, like that is a tough one if lafc lose him this off oh, okay yeah i want to throw this they have two open dp spots that's the other thing yeah. and i wrote this in my in my my post-mortem season like they brought in Mario Gonzalez instead of bringing in a young DP with the idea that Mario Gonzalez was going to be the difference between what we saw from this team against Club Leon and what they were hoping to do in League's Cup, Campeones Cup, and MLS Cup playoffs. And he was not the difference. Mario Gonzalez was tough. Um, maybe there's a David Goss theorem <laughs> in there next year, but like... It, it, coming from a really low bar like by the time we got deep into the playoffs nathan ordaz the 19 year old homegrown was ahead of mario gonzalez on on the number nine he came in the 89th minute of a game they were losing as the main center forward and attacking option off the bench so does that mean that maybe they try to go for a buyout and bring in a, a, a dp number nine i don't know um do they bring carlos vela back on a deal that is below max tam so he's the type of dp player then that allows access to all of those u22 slots that kind of makes sense but if it was a choice between carlos vela in that spot and diego palacios in that spot and a great 
number nine, a DP number, like a true 25, 28, a Cucho style number nine. Let me just throw out, I think some of the reporting right now is the belief that the U22s will no longer be linked. Okay. Every team will get all three automatically is one of the things we I heard that was hear. still up in the Yes. I, it's not a, some something is coming and we'll get to that yes. in the the But so statement. that may not matter. Honestly, I think when you look at Carlos Vela in this game over the course of this season, he has to be open to accepting his role on the team. I think that's the biggest thing when you talk about what Vela will be is like he will not be a full-time he starter. He should be El Sino. But he needs to be comfortable with that. Yeah. Because you run the danger of it being an issue in the team. And I'm not saying Carlos Vela won't be, but like, that's where you start. You walk into the room and that's the first conversation you have before you even talk about money is like, are you going to be comfortable being a part of this team in this way? Yeah. Will you still be a leader and still be yourself? I agree that's with you. But if you don't have a better player than Carlos Vela at that nine position, which they did not. Yeah, but they have two DPs. They have okay, an off so, season. Yeah. But you can't go to Carlos and say that unless you're presenting him with a plan that shows that you're going to go do those things. Well, you, you would. I mean, well, yeah, I thought they would in the summer too. Maybe, but he was still on the DP contract. Now they, they had an open DP. Slot. It was. It ended For up sure. being weird that they kept a DP slot open all year long. Uh, they went out and they were aggressive and kind of groundbreaking in the types of young players that they got. I don't think any of them really hit. I like Bogush. I don't yeah. love him. I Olivera, like, Olivera I like is the Olivera. one I thought that looked the most effective. But he did. Those but, are all long term plays, right? The idea is Buke. Bogus trust and the Vera. for sure, yeah. but it's tough to be as confident in this group going forward because the the season Bawanga just had is absolutely remarkable and probably not repeatable. And they didn't have any other answers in the final third, especially because again, Trundolo has whittled away so much of the everything except set pieces and trend the transition has been whittled away. It feels like with this team, and then on top of that. Ilya is 33. Yeah. Mario's 29. Mario's going to be 30, I think, early next season. Long is going to be, I think, 32 early next season. There, uh, Howling's head is going to be 33 next season. Like, I'm not saying the window is shut, but there's more urgency to make moves that work right away this offseason for LAFC um, than there was last offseason. And that might mean the hardest conversation with Carlos Vela. It, it really might. Uh, of the free agent list that you gave, I'd be shocked if Palacios or Acosta were back. Same. So I think Palacios made clear he wants to go to Europe. There was rumors in the past. Acosta is an interesting one. He's always said that. I don't know that that window is open. I, I, He has been a full-time starter for three different clubs that have finished first in the Western Conference in the last seven years from Dallas to Colorado to LAFC. In the conversation we had last week about Darlington Nagby, Acosta's not the same player, probably not on the same level, but when you look at a good roster build, Kellen Acosta is part of that, right? His understanding of the league, his flexibility, the quality that he can play at, set-piece service, all those things. So if the right team in MLS comes around for the right contract, he could be a really special pickup but not on like a DP deal. So it's going to be interesting to see where he sees his career and where he ends up. Cause this was, he had a bad year and he had a bad year because it feels like maybe LAFC already knows he's out and they didn't really invest in him as a part of this group. He had a bad year maybe because as the game model shifted, he was less comfortable in it and less useful. And like you look around the league, most teams could use a Kellen Acosta in midfield. Yeah. Specifically out of six. And I think, at this point in his career, with an eye toward 2026 in the national team and being Tyler Adams' backup defensive midfielder, he's got to land at a place where he's a full-time defensive midfielder. Not a box-to-box -box guy, not a number eight, and even a 4-2-3-1, not a number eight. In the, he's got to be the six. He's got to be the guy who runs the show. That's the best thing for Kellen Acosta. Quickly on the crew... I mean, it's they just won the title. Let's let them enjoy Ooh, it. Have a parade tomorrow. But classic MLS fashion. You got to cut everyone uh, in like the next ten. Yeah. Well, any any sort of flashing lights in their off season that you would yeah key Wilfred into. Nance. Just, not that he has said he wants to go anywhere, but he's not from Columbus, right? He is from France. That is, in a lot of people's estimation, a, a bigger league. He has shown what he's capable of as a coach. He has trusted himself too, right? He left Montreal for Columbus in what we have said is an unorthodox move with pure belief in himself. So for Columbus, the offseason has to start with, 
is is Nancy the one putting all these pieces together? And if he's not, is anyone else capable of doing it in the same way, or do you have to readjust slightly? Um, I think Columbus has that overall vision that we talk about from far away, which is Tim Bezbachenko sort of keeping things on the track between multiple coaches and different DPs and whatever else happens. That's the first conversation they have to have. And a lot of people bring up Ligon. I think Belgium makes more sense with Nancé of like Ronnie Dyla won MLS Cup and went there. Other MLS coaches have gotten rumors and connections and offers. I think Jim Curtin was rumored as a connection there. That's a league where it's about development and selling. And that's what Nancé has done really well already in a short time as head coach. He's obviously fluent in French. It's spoken there to some extent. Wherever he ends up, I don't know the Flemish French breakdown right now off the top of my head, so I'm not going to go there. I think that's It'll be in North Belgium. There you go. Yeah. There, thank you. Yeah. That would be one of those things that would make sense. I hope. I would hope if I'm Columbus, like it's just one year. Let's extend this. Let's go compete yeah. in continental competition, right? In Champions Cup. Let's go win Leagues Cup. Let's put a supporter shield season together. I, I would assume Nancy would be okay with that. If that's the case, a lot of this is still. Like going down the, you know, a lot of these players are under contract. A lot of these players are in good spots. They re signed Darlington Nagby to an extension. There are spots to fill. I would have said Yaya Boa as a, repla- a replacement left wing yeah. back 12, 12, 48 hours ago. By the way, we haven't given enough credit. I know he's been sort of a hit or miss at times player for them. It's been brilliant, but it's also been like, oh, that was bad defensive positioning there from you. But he was a right wing TAM player signed by Caleb Porter. Yeah. And he, now he's a left wing back scoring game winning goals in the MLS Cup. Arguably the best player on the field. On the field. So, so some numbers for you. Just think about what they could do. And this goes back to a good roster build. Kevin Molino almost certainly is going to come off the books at 735k. Julian Gressel, it doesn't seem Hot like. Hot boy, congratulations. Yeah, doesn't seem. <laughs> doesn't seem. He had a great. By the Julian way, go Gressel. check his Instagram. Yeah. Hot boy had an inspirational Instagram post. Amazing caption. Right. Wonderful stuff. You know I love that. Julian Gressel probably not coming back. Probably yeah. that's 884 on their cap. Right now, and you look at all the numbers up and down, man, they are manageable. Maybe you got to give Kucho a raise. Like 300,000. Yeah. That is like, there are going to be some guys who get raises. I think the bulk of this team is going to be back. The, I, I wouldn't be shocked if Molino was back just at a smaller number. Um, Gressel, I would be shocked if he's in Columbus next year, which is understandable. He's a starting, he's yeah. an excellent player. He'll want to go somewhere where he can start. Um, the other one is okay, there could be the type of author offer for Aiden Morris that makes you say, all right, well, we got to, you know, he wants to go to Europe. This is the right offer. This will happen. Uh, could happen for Patrick Schulte as well. Um, could happen for Cucho. And you try uh, to hold on to Cucho. You hope that he gets into Colombia and plays in Copa America. And then you try to sell him in well, the summer. If that's him, the way it goes. And you say to him, you're, you made the team playing here. Don't throw things in the, air. like if you make a move right now, you don't know how much minutes you're going to yeah. get going into Copa America, which is here. So, like, we're in this together. Let's play. You'll play really well to start next season. We'll play in CONCACAF, so you'll compete against League MX some teams, whatever. Then you'll play in Copa America, and then we and, can oh, figure it out. And, oh, by the way, Club World Cup as well. You know, maybe we can make this a couple of years, and then, you know, yeah. we're but selling, like, these we're are the selling Club World Cup now. Let's go. These are the conversations that every good MLS team is going to have to have with their players every single year. This is not us picking on the crew and, you know, dismantling a championship team. It's just the reality. There are, you know, a million soccer teams in the world. There are five of them that are not yeah. selling teams. And none of those five are in MLS. On Cucho, remember that he's more of the Joseph model of went to Europe, right. had the uncomfortable situations, didn't get playing time, and came here versus Almiron, who wanted that test later on and left. And that's sort of how Atlanta dealt with that. It'll be interesting to see where Cucho falls on that. On Aiden Morris, I would throw out... I think a raise is an inevitability. Yeah, for sure. Like, but like if he's saying, yeah, this is the project I want. I want to be the leader of this team. Yeah. I want to rebuild this club or continue to build this club around if me. If I could choose one player in MLS, just pluck him out, start building a club around him right now, it would be Cucho based on his talent profile and his age. And flexibility. Yeah, yeah. straight up. Yeah. So if you're the crew, you're like, yeah, that, I mean... Can we go afford to buy another Cucho, even if we get whatever number for him? Probably not. Uh, on Aiden Morris, I would throw in the two best prospects coming through for Columbus are both center mids. So there could be a space where if Morris wants to push and go somewhere. Sounds like something Wilfred would love. So I would say you, pro- you probably have belief in Zawadzki that he could play a ton of minutes. Maybe you go out and get a veteran guy like in a junior Moreno type mold to just fill some minutes while Maroka and Taha everyone sort of come through. But those are the two guys that are like 
the crown jewels of their setup and they made back-to-back MLS Pro finals. And as I said, they were awarded Academy of the Year. So they have a lot that they're excited about. But that one position profile makes sense. Unless Aiden Morris says, I want to be Nagby. I want to, this is my club. I came through the Academy. I want to be here for 10 years. I want to win 100 MLS Cups. Aiden Morris was at North Star. Morning after cup Whoa. with the fam. Yeah, we went, we went got a little your star. Mm. By the way, I also got a recommendation on Wario's sandwiches. Nice. Had a steak sandwich, Wario style. Ate the whole thing. Regretted it as far as, you know, just consumption. But as far as flavor and taste, no. No regrets. It's a Wario. Uh-huh. Yeah. That was maybe not the best plug of the restaurant that I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> it's I think just a huge was sandwich. saying that it's Wario's delicious. was really good. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Bring All right. a friend. All right, we're putting a bow on this one. We will always take mail about MLS Cup and anything that we've said or you saw that we didn't, et cetera. We were stoked, and it was a great MLS Cup. Yes. It was like the perfect bow to a season. It is special. I will throw one thing out there. I ranted about this on Total Soccer Show, so you can go listen there, too. If you are a team, a fan of an MLS team, there is no reason your team can't be the crew. Yeah. There is no reason that your coaches and your front office can't have that belief and push their team and get players get that those fit players. their model. Exactly. Steal the cup. Yeah. Now, for that's what for years and years, it, take it your used opportunity. to be like, oh, this player XYZ, they'll come to New York. They'll come to LA. They won't come to Columbus or Salt Lake. Well, look at look at the guys that Columbus just signed. Look at the guys that Salt Lake just signed. Brian Vera just made his d- debut for Columbia. You know, like the, the, it can happen. Every Every single market in this league has the ability to do this and play this type of game. That's on you. Speaking of, it could happen. Blink 4K, who's favored to win 2024 MLS Cup? Also in Houston, Texas, MLS Cup Final 2024 prediction. Hold it down, Houston Dynamo against Inter Miami, a U.S. Open Cup Final nice. rematch. Just fire from the hip. I right think, now, fire from the hip. Who you got? I MLS Cup 2024. Obvious, there's going to be an obvious name all year, which is going to be Inter Miami. Inter Miami. Yeah. Yeah, like Lionel Messi has won every trophy he's competed for at this point except for coupe franc and now he's come to mls one leagues cup he'll get a chance to do it's the final frontier for yeah, Lionel I mean, Messi. he'll he'll, he'll fill a pow he'll get a chance to do the the supporter shield he'll get a chance to do open cup he'll Champion, get a chance to do concaf champions cup and he'll get a chance to do mls cup. i'm not picking him to win all of it but the smart money is on Lionel Messi at the end of the year holding that trophy. I will. Way, s- Philip Howe is the Philip F. Anschutz trophy. Just in, I just yeah. occurred to me that perhaps we could have let not, people know no, that everyone, an hour and a half yeah. ago. Everyone, because you're in the I culture. Assumed everyone, that, uh, I assumed that they would know, yeah. but okay. So, so here's the. I'll th- take Miami on the East. What about the West? Well, let me just say this: in Cincinnati last year, like trending up towards the end of the year, first year of a build, Columbus would have been the obvious one of that. Had they not already done it? Had they not already done it? The only other team that fits that model for me besides St. Louis, which I think is going to be tough to replicate totally unless they invest a lot, would be Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, they they figured it out as Depending it went along, on, I but Almada is completely an unknown. And Miles Robinson's an unknown. Yeah. So there is not an obvious team that it feels like is going to jump from this year. So it Inter Miami's the one. And Cincinnati, the West. Cincinnati will be in the convo. Columbus will be in the convo. Trying to get you to the West. And now in the West, I don't really have one, is my point. Like, yeah. if Houston goes out and makes a splash as a DP9, they are the obvious one. I like what Vancouver has done. It doesn't feel like they have a big jump in them. They are going to be like a maybe home team compete for playoffs again. And RSL in that convo as well. But the top three are St. Louis, Seattle, and LAFC. And there's a decent chance all three of them fall off. Who's your West? Just fire one. Dave just we at us. Seattle. Because I, I, I think Seattle, even without Nico and Rui Diaz, ended up playing really good soccer throughout most of the year. And they're going to go out and they're going to get um, an attacking DP who could be a little bit better off the dribble and who can um, play that final ball. But I will say, all season long this year, the East was so much better than the West. And as of right now, I think that's still going to be the case in 2024. You've West heard it. Has won two supporters Messi, shields in 2016. On December 11th, is MLS Cup champion. And like record points. Yeah. State of the league, Commissioner Don Garber ahead of MLS Cup. It is a tradition, usually news coming out of that. The big news, no fourth designated player spot, but quote from Don, there will be some exciting things that we're going to announce next week in regard to player movement. That is 
All uh, of that needs to go to the group of owners and inform them and have it approved, but there are no plans for a fourth DP. He also talked about the challenge of scheduling, and perhaps there would be solutions to that um, in terms of roster changes or tournament participation or, I, I don't know, some some way to manage that congested schedule better. So clearly that is something That's that why Tom's not on today. The league is we didn't get that about. fourth DP spot. Mm-hmm. Tom did hit us up because the offseason has begun. Reminded me to uh, talk about Zach Steffen to the Rapids. I almost forgot about this from last week. Apparently, the Rapids are in advanced talks to sign Zach Steffen. And then there was a move this morning. I don't think it's official official, but Brendan Plone has tweeted it, etc. That the Rapids have traded Andrew Gutman back to the fire, his hometown team, where he was a homegrown had they wanted to sign him or offered him a deal that he wanted to sign. So Gutman's headed to the fire in exchange. Colorado are getting 24-year-old left back in Venezuelan international Miguel Navarro. So now there's a Navarro and a Navahu, both spelled the same way on the Rapids. Colorado also gets 450 k in GAM. That seems like a very good deal for the Rapids. Yeah, they acquired Gutman midseason for between 450 and 550 depending on how much actually. It's weird Colorado. because I thought Gutman was really good a couple of years ago playing in the Red Bull system. Now he played as a left center back yeah. in a three, five, two. I'm not sure that that's what Chris Armis is going to. I think he's going to go with a four, two, two, two. And I don't know that he would trust Gutman as a fullback in that formation. Yeah. So if Navarro is a starting level MLS player and they got the money back. Is he? I think so. Yeah. Okay. So I think that is, as you said, a good trade for the Rapids. Um, Juan got traded for Hector Herrera. I think that's the report. No, not yeah. Hector Herrera. Sorry. Aaron, Aaron Herrera. Herrera. The Stephen Goff reporting of the Washington Post that uh, Montreal and D.C. have been discussing a swap uh, of right backs, Aaron Herrera and Juan, per sources. Probably some money involved as a make weight as well. Herrera, Herrera makes twice as much money yeah. as Juan. Both of those guys got traded in the first day of the window last I know. year. Yeah. Herrera to Montreal, Juan from Orlando to D.C. Feels like a salary dump for Montreal to that point. And also, he was injured for most of the year, Aaron Herrera. He was. When he's healthy, though, he's a guy who's in... He makes one of the five best. Right Given that Goff league. also reported that DC were planning to trade Chris Dirk into St. Louis for Jared Stroud, Lucas Bartlett, and 300K in GAM, would you then think that given the fact that they're trying to get Herrera and Lucas Bartlett would be good depth at center back if you were going to say play three in the back with wing backs and just cross the ball to Benteke? They don't have a coach, right? Yeah, they don't have a coach. I don't yeah. think you have a formation in mind if you don't have a coach. I think those are like three budget good signings that – will not make your team worse. I think it might be the the opposite. I think it might be Ali McKay, the new chief That's soccer officer, has a formation in mind Interesting. and wants to play a certain way and get the pieces for that, irrespective of the coach being signed by now or not. And the coach is going to be doing the job laid out by the CSO. Can I, I just return, say, though, can, can to, I just, to Jack just, Stefan? I mean, we, we, we breezed right over. He was but, the national team starting goalkeeper mere years ago yeah he was at manchester city tim howard road from manchester to colorado uh zach stefan some goalkeepers can not play every week and still keep the knife sharp uh zach stefan was not one of those guys he he got he got worse when he left mls for manchester city and i don't blame him at all for making that jump any player in the world would make that jump if the money and just the the prestige and the the platform of playing for one of the the winningest greatest clubs in the world and he took his shot and he had a couple of good games he had, he didn't have many more than that though and um the hope is that he can rediscover uh what he was in 2018 and then add on to that because the potential is still there for him to be a, a very very good keeper it's going to be an interesting role under armis um because historically there's a decent amount of sweeper keeper action in there and we don't know 100 percent how chris is going to play but we think we know um plus that's a team that doesn't go out and spend huge so like zach stefan is going to be a big part of that team he's going to be a leader he's going to be a face of that team but they have tried to find a goalkeeper for what four years now and they keep signing guys and no one fits so i guess this is the big big swing speaking of fits coaching market remains open five jobs yet to be filled though rumors surrounding some of them new england charlotte dc red bulls and montreal orlando per tommy scoops poppy is on the verge of a new deal tbd on the front office and then of course free agency opens wait in wait a couple wait days. top but- bin 90 who uh report on charlotte uh, do some good work they're reporting that dean smith is finalizing a move to become charlotte fc's next head 
coach. I believe oh, Dean nice. Smith was uh, at like an Aston Villa watch party in New York the other day. Ooh. So Dean Smith's been really, a good week for the villains. Yeah, two feet into the North American market for Dino. Nice. Free agency opens some names to keep uh, your eye on. Miles Robinson, Julian Gressel, Kai Wagner, Kellen Acosta, Diego Palacios, Rubio, uh, Diego Rubio, uh, Nico Ladero, Maxime Cripo, Gustavo Bo, Chicharito, Carlos Vela, and many, many more. We'll be back on Thursday to break down all the news that happens. In the meantime, congratulations to your 2023 MLS Cup champion, the 27th in history, Columbus Crew. What a wonderful final it was. What a wonderful team they are and a deserving champion as well. Thank you to everyone we saw in Columbus or Yes, I saw. It was wonderful to see you. Shout out to well. the crew fan I saw in uh, Las Vegas who was stoked about the game. Yeah. By the way, you were at a championship. I was. Go Lakers. Yeah. Oh. For, that's a story <laughs> for a different day. All right. Enjoy your week, everybody. Adios.